Savior came from glory. And he gave the life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. Heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning. And I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory! again and those that want gather around the altar for prayer tonight at Wednesday night service. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory and I heard about the street of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angel singing and the old redemption story some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me, yeah, I knew him, and all my love. Obviously, you can be seated. Obviously, uh, every Wednesday we have our prayer meetings and uh, um, always enjoy having these. I've had a, a Wednesday night uh, bridge college class that I've, I've been teaching, so I haven't been able to be out here as much for our prayer meetings, so I missed it. So I'm glad to be out here tonight. So uh, anybody with any prayer requests or praises, anything that's on their hearts and minds tonight? Yes, Peggy. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. 
Good. Good. Praise the Lord. Good. Good. Very glad to hear that. Anybody else? Yes. Anybody else? Christy? No, I'm going to pray for Okay. We'll pray for her. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We'll keep him in your prayers. Back. Uh, where? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Right. That's right. When, when do they get back? Saturday. Okay, we'll keep them in our prayers. Yes, ma'am. Another prayer request? All right. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Where? Miss <laughs> Jane, I'm sorry. I, I do have, I struggle. This is the, I, like, I always struggle with this. I'm always not hearing or seeing people. I'm sorry, Miss Jane, go ahead. I promise I was not ignoring you. Okay. Mm. okay. Right. You will, absolutely. Anybody else? Over where? Right there. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Anybody else? Yes. Anybody else? Okay. Yes. You mentioned her. We will be praying for her. Anybody else? Missing anybody? All right. Well, I'll, if it's okay, I'd like to add a prayer request in myself. Um, some of you may remember before I started working here at the church full time, I worked at a Christian radio station uh, in downtown Tampa. And um, I believe some of you even listened to one of the shows I produced for quite a while the, the Bill Bunkley show. Bill Bunkley, a uh, great man of God, he uh, would go to Tallahassee, our state capital, and fight for our religious liberties. Uh, a man who really was on the battleground, on the forefront for fighting for us and, and doing his very best. Um, and uh, just a wonderful man of God I worked with. Uh, found out on Monday uh, that he has been diagnosed with leukemia. Um, and uh, fortunately, he told me that they did find it in the fairly early stages of the disease uh, and that they said they are going to uh, start treatment on him tomorrow. He's going to be in the Moffitt Cancer Center for the next four weeks 
uh, he won't even be leaving. He'll be there for four weeks doing the treatment, and they said the treatment is to cure it. It's not to do anything else but to completely get rid of it. So uh, it's a little bit of a praise. They caught us so early, but please keep him in your prayers. He's a man uh, very near and dear to my heart. So if you can, please keep him in your prayers. Uh, with that, uh, Charlie, go ahead and uh, open us up with Sweet Hour of Prayer. Sweet Hour of Prayer. up all these requests to God in prayer now. God, we give them to 
uh, tonight's offering will be go, uh, going to uh, the Good Samaritan Fund. We all know how what a wonderful uh, ministry, uh, all the good work that they do, and so that is where tonight's offering uh, will be going. Uh, Brother Tom, why don't you uh, uh, bless the offering for us tonight? up for our musicians tonight doing a good job uh so as i mentioned earlier we have some great special singing for you tonight uh and uh we actually one of our special singers i so rudely ignored during our prayer request so very sorry for that jane but please welcome up jane armagast I've been ignored before, Ace. <laughs> Pray for me tonight. Uh, I fell down the steps last night. I hurt my knee and I turned both ankles. So my, and my blood pressure is up because I'm in pain. So I'll do the best I can to hit these high notes. So. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. I'm only human I'm just a woman Help me believe in what I could be And all that I am Show me the stairway T. 
teach me to take one day at a time One day at a time Sweet Jesus That's all I'm asking from you Just give me the strength To do every day What I have to do This one of my favorite songs, and um, if you just listen to the words, wow, it's really something. It had been three days, his parents couldn't find him. But the scribes and the Pharisees were all gathered round him as a boy in the temple, speaking with such wisdom. They were amazed at what he said, and in the middle of it all, there was Jesus. The one crying in the wilderness, John the baptizer, spoke of one who was to come, baptizing with fire. When John baptized him, the heavens were opened, and God descended like a dove, and in the middle of it all, There was Jesus The wedding at Canaan The wine made from water Going to the ruler's house To bring life to his daughter He spoke with authority Straight from the Father No one could explain away his power and in the middle of it all there was Jesus on a hill just outside of town a man hung there bleeding dying for the souls of men to captives bring freedom three days later his tomb was empty he conquered death and the grave yes in the middle of it all there There in the middle That's where he's always been So be strong and take courage When you think you're gonna fall Cause right in the middle of it all There is Jesus There is
actually. Uh, Miss Lisa Carlton uh, will also come up with a, a special song for us. song that I gave you the other day or I gave it to uh, Ryan um, I choose Christ this song is for Bill Blanchard he's been after me for several months to sing this song and it's not as easy to remember words as it used to be so pray for me and hopefully that'll work well <laughs> It was not the path I would have chosen I could see no hope from where I stood Even though I knew what God had promised I didn't see how he could work it for my good Yet that road of pain became my companion It took me to an unexpected place And standing in the middle of the darkness That was where my heart would learn to say I choose Christ When everything says give up I choose faith I choose to trust to believe he is good he'll come through like he said he would every day I will choose Christ I don't know the story he's unfolding but I know he has a plan So every day my prayer is to surrender Even when I cannot understand I choose Christ When everything around me says give up I choose faith, I choose to trust to believe he is good he'll come through like he said he would every time oh i choose christ his grace is sufficient whatever happens in my life i have made my decision no matter what the price i choose choose faith, I choose to trust, to believe he is good, he'll come through like he said he would every time. Oh, I choose Christ, I believe he is good, he'll come through like he said he would every time. Oh, I choose Some good singing tonight, amen. amen. Love being able to have uh, uh, talented people being able to display their talent uh, for our church and for the Lord. Um, uh, before I get started tonight, uh, one thing that I'm actually going to be preaching on Sunday night as well, so I'll probably 
be expressing the same thing I'm about to express tonight, and that is uh, gratitude. Uh, this is the first chance I've had to be able to uh, preach to you guys since uh, me and uh, Tony Joe got married a few weeks ago. Uh, and, and Tony Joe and I just wanted to thank all of you uh, for your well wishes, your encouraging words, uh, your gifts, uh, your, just your encouragement uh, over uh, the, the weeks leading up to the wedding. Uh, we thank you so much for coming. Uh, those of you that were able to come to our wedding, and of course, we we're still receiving all sorts of gifts and, and, and well wishes afterwards as well. Um, we are truly grateful. Uh, and it's times like this, uh, you know, I was talking with Tony Joe about this, uh, you know, how good God is. Uh, I'm, you're looking at a blessed man tonight, and, and uh, I, I love you guys. I love this church very much. I'm so privileged to be able to call the church my home church that I grew up in. And I can say that I serve that same church. And so I love you guys very much, and I just wanted to let you know that uh, tonight. Um, now let's dive into what we want to talk about tonight. Uh, but let me start off by asking you a question. Uh, do you know what a movie sequel is? You've ever heard of what a movie sequel is? It's basically a follow-up to an original movie, right? There's part one, and then there's a part two, sometimes a part three and a part four maybe. And there's all sorts of uh, sequels found in different types of movies. You see sequels in horror movies. Uh, somehow the serial killer that died at the end of the first one somehow comes back to life in the second one. And he comes back to life in the third one and the fourth one. But we also see sequels in action movies, superhero movies, science fiction movies. We even see sequels in romantic comedies. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but sequels are becoming more and more common and the list of original movies is, that's coming out on a yearly basis is becoming smaller and smaller year after year. In fact, I did a little bit of research that by the end of 2018, during this one calendar year, there will be 30 movie sequels that will have been released into our theaters. So that's more than one per weekend. And over 100 other movie sequels are actually in the works right now at various studios in Hollywood and around the world. And so some may ask, what in the world? Why are there so many sequels being made? Well, to put it simply, there's a lot of money being spent on making these movies, and so these producers and these executives, they want to make sure they get their money back, and a little bit more. And so bringing back characters and stories from a previously successful movie would be considered a safe bet. And that's why we see so many sequels out there. Well, I bring that up because, believe it or not, the Bible is filled with stories and books that would be considered sequels or follow-ups to other stories. Some of these are rather obvious. There's 1 Samuel, and then there's what? 2 Samuel. There's 1 Kings, then 2 Kings. 1 Chronicles, and 2 Chronicles. We even find some of the apostles that wrote letters in the New Testament have sequels. The Apostle Paul wrote 1 Corinthians... Then there was 2 Corinthians. And uh, John actually wrote a trilogy. There was 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. I probably sound like a nerd right now. But there are other sequels in the Bible that are actually a little less well-known and a little less obvious than the ones that I just listed. For example, did you know that in the Bible, there's actually a sequel to the book of Jonah? And no, it's not 2nd Jonah. Now, I actually preached on the book of Jonah in the past, but there's one thing that I want you to know or to remember when it comes to uh, the book of Jonah. Uh, see, the, the story, it really isn't about Jonah. It's not really about Jonah being swallowed up by a big fish, although that may be the most famous part of the story. It really is about God forgiving and redeeming the evil city of Nineveh. Uh, more accurately, it's really just about the forgiveness and, and grace of God. As I'm sure you remember from that story, though, the story of Jonah, uh, that Jonah was called to preach to the city of Nineveh. Of course, he fought against that calling at first, but eventually he relented after being swallowed by the fish. But when he did go to Nineveh, he went and he preached and prophesied to the Ninevites that if they did not repent and turn from their wicked ways, God would destroy them. Well, we see that the Ninevites did repent, and they did ask God for forgiveness. And so God ended up sparing the city from complete destruction that he promised he would bring if they continued to do what they were doing. 
And so the book of Jonah ends in this way, and it seems like the Ninevites have a happy ending, even if Jonah himself isn't happy about that. But then there's the sequel, and it's actually found in the book of Nahum. So if you have your Bibles with me tonight, please turn with me to the book of Nahum, chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 7 and 8. Nahum, chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Now this sequel, the book of Nahum, would take place somewhere between 100 to 150 years after the book of Jonah. Now we will see that, unfortunately, the Ninevites ultimately would not enjoy a happy ending. Now somewhere between the book of Jonah and the book of Nahum, again, a time period about 100 to 150 years, the city of Nineveh turned back to their wicked ways, which caused God to change his mind in preserving the city. And so tonight, we're going to be doing a, a kind of an overview of the book of Nahum. So if you found Nahum chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, please stand with me in the reverence of reading God's word. And I want to read these two verses because I believe this perfectly encapsulates what this book, the book of Nahum, is all about. This is what it says in verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. Before I go any further tonight, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you so much for the people that came out tonight, God, to worship you. Thank you for the wonderful singing and the spirit that we've already felt. But God, as always, I invite that you come down, Lord, in a mighty way, that you walk up and down these aisles, that we feel you here tonight. God, touch my lips, touch my tongue, that I preach exactly what you want me to preach tonight on the book of Nahum. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. So the two verses that we just read here is actually a small picture of what the entire book of Nahum is really about. See, just like the book of Jonah, uh, the book of Nahum, it's not about the prophet Nahum. It's not about Nineveh. And it's not about the people of Judah who were God's people that had been captured and enslaved by the Ninevites in, at this point in history. No, the, the story is about God. By studying this book, we can actually learn a lot about the God that we serve. So tonight, I want us to look through the three chapters of this little-known book of Nahum, which again reveals some very important truths about our Lord. So the first thing I want you to notice is that in chapter 1, it reveals that our God is a comforter to those who trust in Him. Our God is a comforter to those who trust in Him. Now, I don't know about you, but, but I'm glad that our God still takes the time to comfort us when we're going through difficult times. Uh, we see throughout the Bible of instances where God takes time to comfort his servants and to comfort his people. And we see it again here in the book of Nahum. See, I, I mention that because there's something very important about this book that I want you to realize tonight. Uh, see, this prophecy, obviously written by the prophet Nahum... It was not written for the Ninevites, even though the prophecy is about the destruction of their city. So the question is, well, if it's not for the Ninevites, who was this written for? Well, it was actually written for God's people, the people of Judah, who, as I mentioned earlier, were still being enslaved by Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire. Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. See, God wanted to Nahum to write what he was going to do to the people of Nineveh to comfort his own people, the people of Judah, who were suffering under their rule. So we see a glimpse of this comfort in uh, verse 7, which is what we just read. And looking at this verse again, we see that God is talking to his people, reminding them that he is a stronghold in the day of trouble. I think it's a good idea to stop here and discuss what exactly a stronghold is. Uh, strongholds were actually a familiar sight in Israel during this time. Uh, they were very important to have, especially if you were in the middle of facing an invading army or maybe an enemy was coming after you to harm you or to, to take a hold of you somehow. Strongholds could be different things. Strongholds could be cities that had a fortified wall around them. But to put it simply, a lot of cities, they were only as strong as their walls were, their strongholds were. Sometimes, though, something that's very interesting is that you would find a stronghold or very much looking like a fort that would be carved into a mountain or a cave. 
In fact, the Bible says in 1 Samuel that David would often take advantage of the strongholds found in mountains or in caves when he was on the run from King Saul. You remember King Saul for a while tried to kill David because he felt threatened by him. Now, I love this illustration of God being a stronghold, even if it is a familiar illustration that we've all heard before. See, whenever you're facing troubles, you can retreat into the stronghold of God. Whenever you are uncertain of the future or you're forced to face down your greatest fears, you can retreat into the stronghold of God. When your insecurities arise up, you can turn to God and let him remind you of your worth. Tonight, rely on God's power to get you to whatever it is that you are facing. He doesn't want you to face it alone. That's why he has provided you his stronghold. But not only does God comfort his people by reminding them of the stronghold that they can run into, he also comforts them by reminding them that he sees what they're going through and he truly cares. Again, look at the end of verse 7. It says that he, God, knoweth them that trust in him. That word knoweth really seems to translate that it's actually that he cares for those who trust in him. Now, again, this is something I don't want to just run past. I want you to notice something that Nahum writes. Nahum says that God cares for those who trust in him. Bible scholar David Guzik said that that word trust here, it implies that the people of Judah have a relationship with God. I was thinking today in, in, our, in our world, it really you don't really have a real true relationship with someone until there's some sort of trust established with that person, right? And I feel it's the same thing with God. We have to put our full trust and faith in him before he can truly care for us as he promises in this verse. Now, while putting our full faith and trust in him may not be necessarily easy, it is worth it. See, when God knows us, he really knows us. Better than we even know ourselves. You will never be alone, and he will be there for you through thick and thin. I love this quote that I found from uh, the great Charles Spurgeon. He talked about God caring for us, and he, he said this, God knows us. He knows our prayers and tears. He knows our wishes. He knows that we are not what we want to be, but he knows what we do desire to be. He knows our aspirations, our sighs, our groans, our secret longings, our chastenings of spirit when we fail. He has entered into it all. He says, yes, dear child, I know all about you. I have been with you when you thought you were alone. I have read what you could not read, the secrets of your own heart that you could not decipher. I have known them all, and I still know them. I thought, isn't it wonderful to have a God who understands and knows everything about you, but yet still loves you and cares about you. So verse 7 provides a lot of comfort to the people of Judah, but Nahum actually uses much of chapter 1 to comfort them, uh, first of all, by recounting that God will take down the Ninevites. He tells them, God is coming for the Ninevites. He will take them down. Then, if you look at verse 15 of chapter 1, it gives the people of Judah some much-needed encouragement. Uh, hope and peace. It says this, Behold, upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. Good news and peace were coming, Nahum said. They could resume their celebrations, they could resume their feasts, they could resume their open worship for the God that they loved. I was thinking, what comfort that must have been for them to be able to read those words. And for the, us today, we can take comfort in knowing that we can run to God in times of difficulty as he is our stronghold. We can take comfort in knowing that God knows exactly what you're going through and still cares for you. And you can take comfort in knowing that there is an end to your suffering and your difficult times, especially if you're going through them at this very moment. So we see that chapter 1 of the book of Nahum reveals that God is a comforter to those who trust in him. But then we see that in chapter 2 of the book of Nahum, it reveals that our God is a just God. 
our God is a just God. Now, as we saw in verse 8 of Nahum chapter 1, just as much as God is a comforting God to those who trust him, we see that he is a jealous and just God and will punish and judge the wicked. Again, you look at verse 8, it says, But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. I was thinking, talk about a completely different tone from verse 7 that we just read. But in chapter 2 of Nahum, uh, Nahum goes into more detail about how God will judge and destroy the city of Nineveh, and the picture is quite bleak for the Ninevites. In fact, not only is it bleak, it's also a very vivid and descriptive picture that we can take a look at today. In verse 3 of of chapter 2, it says that the army that would be invading Nineveh would be wearing scarlet, that their shields would be red, that this would definitely be an intimidating intimidating sight to see as you see an invading army coming your way. But on top of that, Nahum gives us an image of soldiers on their chariots with spears. Verse 4 goes on to paint a very chaotic scene within the city of Nineveh once the invading army forces its way in. He said this, the chariots shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one against another in the broadways. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like the lightnings. Then verse 6 tells us that things will get even worse for the Ninevites. He said, the gates of the river shall be open and the palace shall be dissolved. Nahum is describing a river that Nineveh was obviously using as a defense, but that this river would begin to flood, causing more chaos for them. And then verse 9 of Nahum 2 describes how the invading army will take all the wealth of the city of Nineveh. The Ninevites would be left with absolutely nothing when the invasion and the destruction was complete, according to this prophecy. Now, of course, since this is a prophecy, the events being described here had not happened yet up to this point. But when you look at the historical account of how Nineveh actually fell, you will see that Nahum's prophecy was absolutely spot on. It's pretty remarkable. For example, uh, the army that would eventually take down the powerful Ninevites in history and take down the Assyrian Empire were soldiers from what was called the Medo-Babylonian Empire. As part of their intimidation tactics, the Medo-Babylonian army would dye their shields a certain color. I'll give you one guess what color they dyed their shields. Red. What a coincidence, huh? Oh, by the way, on top of that, they were known for wearing certain colored clothing. I'll give you one guess on what that was. Scarlet clothing. Crimson clothing. What a coincidence, huh? On top of that, you remember how Nahum predicts how the gates of the rivers would open up and they would be flooding? Well, one reason why Nineveh was such a powerful city during this time was that they were surrounded by water barriers and that they used as a defense against invasions. And on the west side of the city, they were guarded by a wall that lined up with the Tigris River. Historical accounts, including even from the Babylonians themselves who were the invaders, they said that the rivers began to flood, which opened up gaps within the walls, making it easier for the invading army to come in and defeat the Ninevites. Oh, and by the way, the part of the prophecy where Nahum said that all the Ninevites' wealth, all their gold, all their silver would just be plundered, well, we actually can look to the Babylonian Chronicle, the the history of the Babylonian Empire, where they said that they took all of the Ninevites' wealth, and they said it was so much that it was a quantity beyond counting. So the vast wealth that the Ninevites took pride in was gone. Why do I point all of this out? Well, I mean, it's not really just to prove to you that the prophecy of Nahum was accurate, although it is nice to be reminded of that. I'm pointing this out to remind us that our God is truly a just God. In fact, not only is he a just God, he is a jealous God. Nahum even wrote that God was a jealous God in the first chapter. Now, this jealousy is not the type of jealousy that we normally think of that a a, a sinful uh, jealousy that causes us to covet what other people have or or need or whatever in this context our God being jealous means that he doesn't like to see his people suffer at the hands of evil and wicked people 
it means that he will judge the people that hurt his people. And I thought this should actually serve us as a reminder as well, that we are not to take vengeance into our own hands. It's God's job to do, not ours. Paul reminded us that hundreds of years later after the fall of Nineveh. He said in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Remember that in the Bible, and I believe Pastor Will has talked about this, that any time anyone writes dearly beloved or they address dearly beloved, it's directed at us, the believers. So Paul is specifically telling us as God's people to not take matters into our own hands when we have been wronged or mistreated. It's not our job to judge. In fact, our job is the complete opposite. It is to love and pray for our enemies, as tough as that may be. We must remember that God will judge those who have done wicked and evil things on this earth if he hasn't already punished them. Let God deal with them. Let God deal with those who have hurt us or made us feel worthless or made us feel like they stabbed us in the back, whatever the case may be. And I just wanted to say this, that whenever you are struggling with this idea, I think we all wrestle with this, the idea of the wicked prospering in this world, or we, we struggle with that idea that they're getting away with something. That, I think that's what makes us mad. This is what I want you to do. Think on the chapter of Nahum, chapter 2. Think of the fact that their day, the wicked's day, is coming. Just like the Ninevites, their day was coming and it did come. So we see that in Nahum chapter 1, it reveals that God is a comforter to those who trust in him. Then we see that Nahum chapter 2 reveals that our God is a just God. And then our last chapter, chapter 3 of Nahum, reveals that God always has reasons for why he does what he does. He always has reasons for why he does what he does. Up until this point of the book of Nahum, the prophet Nahum is telling us about the future destruction of Nineveh. And as we just discussed, chapter 2 went into detail about how the city would be destroyed. Then we, then we come to the last chapter, and there's a, a bit of a, a change or a shift in what this prophecy is about. Now God is about to tell the people of Judah why Nineveh is about to experience his wrath and judgment. It actually gives four different reasons. Well, the first reason that he gives for punishing them is for the Ninevites' wicked, evil violence. In the first verse of chapter 3, God calls Nineveh a bloody city. Then in verse 3 of that chapter, he talks about their practice of stacking dead corpses on top of each other. Uh, see, history, even outside of the Bible, will tell us that the Ninevites and the Assyrian Empire together were an incredibly cruel people, especially to their prisoners of war and to their captives. They would impale live victims on poles and leave them out in the desert sun to literally roast to death. They beheaded thousands of their enemies and other people, stacking their skulls outside of the gates of cities. Their violence was basically a source of pride for them. They are even known for skinning people alive. We also saw that the Ninevites and the Assyrians, they were even known to kill babies and little children. God saw all of that. He saw all of that wicked, evil violence, and he wanted Nahum to point out that that would be one reason for their downfall. But another reason why God was punishing the Ninevites was that they were leading other nations and other peoples into immorality that they had already taken part of. Verse 4 of chapter 3 compares Nineveh to a prostitute seducing people to do things that they shouldn't. This, this immorality that the Ninevites would seduce other nations and other peoples to do included all sorts of sins, but specifically talking about black magic, a sorcery, a practicing witchcraft. God was holding the Ninevites responsible for leading other nations into doing these type of evil sins. But then also God said, another reason why I'm going to destroy the Ninevites it's because of their sin of pride. The Ninevites, they thought of themselves as indestructible. They thought of themselves as just greater than they really were. Nahum actually brings up another city that was once great and powerful in verse 8 of chapter 3. He talks about the city called No Ammon. 
Now, we better know this city, know Ammon, as the ancient Egyptian city of Thebes. You might remember the city of Thebes when you were in school, but Thebes was a very powerful city, like Nineveh. Thebes was a city surrounded by water, like Nineveh. But they were eventually brought down. They were eventually humbled. They were actually defeated and put into captivity. Their arrogance, a thinking that no one could actually take them down, it was actually led to their downfall. And in verse 11 of chapter 3 suggests that Nineveh is going to go through the same thing. It said this, and Nahum wrote this in the verse 11. I thought this was interesting. He said to Nineveh, Thou shalt also be drunken. Thou shalt also basically be drunk. Now the question may be, what does that mean? What is he talking about? The Ninevites being drunk. As I studied some more into this, I saw that the scholars will tell you that what Nahum meant here by them being drunk is that the Ninevites would be drunk from their own power and prestige. In other words, the Ninevites allowed their success and their dominance to go to their heads, making them think that they were indestructible, that they were the best, just like thieves thought that they were the best, that they were indestructible. This would make them too arrogant to see their own downfall that would be coming very soon. And I was thinking, listen, I think all of us in here are too smart to, to not know that no one is indestructible, especially when we are up against an all-powerful God. And getting full of ourselves, it's, it's only going to hurt us, just like it hurt the Ninevites and the city of Thebes. Proverbs 16, 18 reminds us of that. It's one of the most famous verses of pride. You know, you've heard this. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. But yet we also see one more reason why Nineveh would be punished according to God. It would, they would be punished for their weak leadership. See, the chapter, and actually the book of Nahum, basically ends on the weakness of the leadership that surrounded the king of the Assyrians that was in charge of Nineveh and this entire empire. Now, again, I, for time's sake, I, I won't go into great detail about this, but I'll, I'll give you a quick overview of those last few verses. Verse 16 of chapter 3 talks about the merchants of the city. They were, they were, very, they were considered uh, very prestigious and the leaders of the city back then. Verse 17 talks about the crown. The crown is actually commanders. Then they talked about captains of the city. And then verse 18 talks about the shepherds, who normally you wouldn't see as necessarily prestigious, but they were still considered somewhat leaders of the livestock, that they were still an important part of society. And then they also talked about the nobles. Yet, when it was time to face the music, Nahum said they were nowhere to be found. They were weak leaders. They couldn't face the music. They ran away. On top of already doing all sorts of evil things and allowing evil things to enter into their nation, as we discussed before. Bible commentator Warren Wearsby, I always love hearing what he has to say. He said this about leadership. He said, whether it's practicing genocide, exploiting the poor, supporting slavery, or failing to provide people with the necessities of life, the sins of national leaders are known to God, and he eventually judges. And I think, you know, this isn't talked about much. There's always a lot of things to try to cover when we are looking for things to preach on. But there is one thing I want to mention here. That weak leadership, it displeases God. Whether you own a business or maybe you have been given a position at a workplace or Maybe you have a family or, or you do something for our church or whatever organization, whatever it is that maybe you have been handed the keys of leadership to, God expects you to carry it out the best that you can. No, you won't be perfect, and God doesn't necessarily expect that, but he does call you to be a strong leader. Do not be like the weak leaders that Nineveh paid dearly for. So we see this third and final chapter of the book of Nahum, it shows that, that God just doesn't punish or judge people for no reason. God never does anything unless there is a reason for it. So when what we read here in the last chapter of Nahum should serve as a reminder that God knows exactly what he is doing and he knows exactly why he is doing it. So Nahum chapter 1 shows a God who is a comforter to those who trust in him. Nahum chapter 2 reveals... A, or that our God is a just God, and of course, what we just read in chapter 3, it reveals that our God always has reasons for what he does. 
I'll wrap up with this. Uh, the fall of Nineveh, it did eventually take place, as I mentioned earlier, somewhere between the years of 613 and 611 B.C. In fact, whatever the invading armies did, it, it, they de destroyed it so badly, there was hardly any traces of the city left. It would make it difficult for historians and archaeologists to try to look for it, and they did try to look for it for hundreds of years. It was fascinating. Where is the city of Nineveh? They actually eventually discovered some evidence of where it was all the way in the 1840s, some 2,000 years after it fell. So the fall of Nineveh still stands as one of the many testaments to who our God is. He is a just God. He has his reasons for everything that he does, including carrying out judgments and punishments. But he is also a safe place, a stronghold that we can run to in times of trouble. And as I was studying for all of this last night and preparing for this, it was something that crossed my mind I wanted to share with you. That maybe for some of you that came tonight, maybe you actually feel like the people of Judah did when they were in captivity with the Ninevites. You're thinking, I'm in trouble. I'm suffering with some type of emotional or physical pain, and I can't seem to get out of it. Whatever it is that you're going through tonight, let me remind you, God has not forgotten you. He hears your prayers, and he will always be your safe place. I'll also just say this. Let the book of Nahum also remind you that he will judge those who have hurt you, who have mocked your faith, or made you feel less than. He will judge them, but we have to let him be the judge. We cannot take matters into our own hands. Let him be the judge. We simply love and pray those people that hurt us. As we bow our heads and close our eyes and Charlie can get ready for a, a song of invitation, maybe that's one of you, maybe one of the things I've talked about tonight is what you're struggling with. Maybe you're struggling physically or emotionally with, with something. You feel like you're one of the people of Judah. You're in captivity, you're in bondage, you can't seem to get out of something. Let me encourage you, run to God. He has a stronghold for you, a safe place for you. You can come forward tonight and run into the arms of God for comfort. And maybe for some of you, you're, you're realizing that you're having bitterness over something that somebody has wronged you about. As I mentioned, let God be the judge. Come forward tonight and just let it go. Give it all to him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you so much for another opportunity to share your word and what you've laid on my heart with the people here, God. And Lord, if there's anybody here tonight that that needs to come to you, God, for whatever it is, whether they need you as your Savior, God, they need you for comfort, or they need to give you their bitterness, Lord. I ask that they come forward tonight. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as Charlie leads us. In Number 81. Just as I have. One more verse to give anybody a chance. Thank you so much for coming out tonight uh, before we wrap up.